Welcome everybody. Welcome to Scholar Strike Canada, Anti-Asian Racism Undone. And the panel uh, that uh, we're entering is called Builder Building Worker Action. My name is Min Suk Lee. And first, let me begin by acknowledging uh, the sacred land that we're on. And the land that we, we live and work on uh, for over 15,000 years. And this land has been home to Indigenous people who have lived and who continue to live in a relation with the land in ways that have been proven to be ecologically sustainable, vital, and deep in our humanity by honoring our relations. This land is the territory of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron Indigenous peoples. Colonization is first and foremost about land, the control of it, and the erasure of Indigenous people from their land. This dispossession continues today. So land acknowledgements like this one are not just words for a footnote in history, but they're words to testify to our responsibilities. Today as settlers, those brought against their will, diasporic people and arrivants. We're all treaty people and let us honor the treaties. So welcome to this space. As I said, it's the panel Building Worker Action and my name is Min Suk Lee. I'm so pleased and really quite honored to have this opportunity to have a focused conversation with two community activists, labor organizers, who have been part of and have led movements for change in this country for decades. For 20 years, Dina Ladd has been working to improve wages and working conditions, primarily for racialized communities, women, low wage workers and immigrant workers. And for the past 12 years, Dina has been working to build a membership based worker center in Toronto that can improve wages and working conditions for many working people. The Workers Action Center, WAC, works primarily with low waged immigrant workers and workers of color in precarious jobs that face discrimination, violations of rights and no benefits in the workplace. Thanks for joining me here, Dina. Great to be here, thanks. Thank you. And Winnie Ng. Winnie is a labor rights activist and scholar with a deep commitment to anti-racism, equity and worker empowerment. Winnie is the immediate past Unifor National Chair in Social Justice and Democracy at Ryerson University. And Winnie Ng started in the labor movement as a union organizer with the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, Immigrant Workers, ILGWU, and then later on with the Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees Union, HERE, Local 75, working with hotel workers. Winnie Ng was the Ontario Regional Director of the Canadian Labour Congress for eight years. And over the decades, Winnie has been involved in innumerable community organizations and is a founding member of the Asian Canadian Labour Alliance. Thank you, Winnie, for joining. Thank you. Good to yeah. be here. It's great to see both of you because I ordinarily see you in rallies or protest or organizing meetings. So this is, um, you know, I think it's an unusual opportunity to carve out time in all of our busy schedules to stop and reflect and to share stories and to think about organizing uh, the strategies and um, you know opportunities for organizing in this particular moment. And I think um, both of you as community and labor organizers, you've been uh, working inside alongside and outside the labor movement and have changed it through your organizing. And you've, the work you have done in, has ensured that Canadian unions have a space for racialized workers, for women, for gender diverse communities. You've changed the labor movement from multiple places of positions and positionalities, and you've radicalized it, in my opinion. You know, in your points of contact, you've radicalized it and challenged Canadian unions to be part of the growth of working class, multiracial, intersectional labor rights organizing. That's transnational. I wanted to talk to both of you about um, the coming to political consciousness and the kind of formative experiences that you have had um, prior to joining the labor movement, because I always find that really interesting. How is it that you came to be the strident challenging change makers that you are right there were formative moments uh, some of them aren't the most pleasant or the easiest to tap into but in many ways they're, they're kind of like the instructional ones in which we learn 
very, I guess, these early life lessons about how racism, sexism, how they work together, you know, um, to enforce poverty. Could we, could I ask both of you to think about um, and reflect on those moments and how you tap into them to, to think about committing to a path of political action? Dina, did you want to start? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, um, I think that my experience in England really started that process of political consciousness. I, I would say that um, I was part of that sort of uh, first generation uh, South Asian, uh, you know, growing up, uh, born in England um, in the 70s. And so it was part of that whole um, first generation British um and and so in some ways um the you know the the racism that we sort of experienced on a day-to-day -day basis um was i think something that you know now i look back and um sort of you know when when i emigrated to uh canada when i was 16 i actually started to just understand it better once I was away from it, because the sort of the daily experiences of racism, of every day going to school and having to be careful of who you might bump into, um, the sort of the skinheads, uh, you know, on the estate, um, the experiences of being with my mum who wore saris and who were constantly harassed on the streets. Um, the issues of my father um, being at work and dealing with a very racist trade union that didn't really step up to support him. Uh, he was a car mechanic. Um, so all of, all of, I think all of those experiences and then the sort of the duality of also being a, a, a South Asian uh, woman um, in a very restrictive uh, and prescriptive uh, family. So very, you know, weren't allowed out of the house. We weren't allowed to cut our hair. We weren't allowed to, to be like the white people. And so it was like my parents, uh, I think a lot of South Asians kind of like try to protect the, the, the culture by not allowing us outside of the house, basically. <laughs> I literally had only ever been on a bus by myself once before I ended up in Scarborough and then having to take like three or four buses to get to high school. So tightly chaperoned, not allowed to wear makeup, not allowed to cut your hair, not allowed to look at boys or sort of, you know, do anything like that the white people were doing basically. And then, but then also being in this situation of, of then growing up in the, in the school system and, and, and dealing with the kinds of racism at school, the streamlining, like many of us were told, like we shouldn't go to school after high school. Like there was so many things. I mean, I, I feel like I could write a book about it. Um, but I think that basically, I think all of that stuff just felt really wrong. It felt really wrong. It felt so unjust. And then it wasn't until I sort of got to Canada that I started to just kind of, and then I became politically, started to understand it because I started Rise when I was 17, got very active in the student union, uh, the student movement, but it was also during a period of very conservative time. So the right wing student union closed down the women's center, tried to pull out of the student movement. Um, the, the, the Ontario Federation of Students tried to close down CKLN, um, tried to, you know, stop us from doing any progressive organizing. It was also the time of Philip Rushton at uh, the, you know, University of Western Ontario, who was, you know, um, espousing eugenics um, in terms of the belief there. And so, and that was also the time of L'Ecole Polytechnique when 14 women were murdered in Montreal. That was in my second year of university here at Ryerson. So all of these things, I think, led to this kind of, um, you know, my formative years being really feeling like stuff did not feel right, but then like really truly understanding, as I said, when I got to Canada. I think all of those injustices and all of those experiences and uh, yeah. started to just really fundamentally make more sense. Right. 
Um, well, thanks for sharing that, like the narrative of the journey of um, starting to uh, live through those experiences and then coming to a point where now you're going to fit those pieces together and, you know, build a frame or an analysis around that or language, words. Um, so before going into like that, um, the articulation of uh, a politic that would, you know, ex kind of organize or explain much of that much of that in some ways which is deeply tra traumatizing very personal very emotional but explain it in a way that is outside of you uh, that is structural and systemic um, i'd like to talk about that but before doing that maybe winnie then we can yeah, um, yeah. bring you into the conversation because if you I, and i've never asked you this Winnie, because you know we never have an opportunity to sit down and reflect like this um Yes, I think a lot of times, actually, I really appreciate this opportunity. I mean, <laughs> this is, to me, this is a, a bit of an intergenerational conversation, right? I'm 20 years older than both of you, probably. So, <laughs> um, so there are a couple of per very personal stories that, you know, I might as well sort of uh, share that. It's, it, I was born in Hong Kong and came to Canada as a lone foreign student in 1968 at the age of 17. So similar age, <laughs> I came on my own. And like then, like most of the foreign students, we were able to work part-time part and uh, work full-time in the summer months to, to put us through school. Um, so there are a couple of work experience that really sort of shape my bearings as a, you know, as a, both as a worker, as an activist, and as a uh, person of color. Uh, one is, um, I, my first job, summer job was uh, in Montreal, was at working as a chambermaid or room attendant now uh, at Queen Elizabeth Hotel, a unionized workplace. Um, and at an, at a dollar twenty five an hour, I clean like any other room attendants, clean seventeen rooms a day. Um, I think mean, it's those four months I experienced race, both racial and sexual harassment. And as a young worker, I was too scared, too ashamed uh, to even complain about it. And I actually, you know, and I was just counting the days that I could leave. Um, so when I left, I left with a sense of anger and guilt, anger that why didn't I speak out <laughs> and guilt that, you know, I had the luxury to go return to the comfort of learning where that was the reality and still very much is the reality of a lot of workers, uh, women of color, immigrant women who work in the hospitality industry. And so, and maybe that's what gives me that, that rage and guilt that gives me that sense to, you know, to keep on speaking out more in the later years. And then the other piece is, uh, my, later on my mom immigrated over uh, in early 1980s and she worked as a sewing machine operator. And, uh, on, on Adelaide and as an older worker uh, at the age of 60 after a couple of years working in in uh, <laughs> a designer's shop uh, she was told by her boss that she was too old she was wasting a mach sewing machine and was asked to uh, to leave you know and so these are I mean to me those experiences sort of stay with me and then I think the last one is as a young mother, uh, watching my daughter, who's now 42, <laughs> coming home, you know, at the age of three, coming home with a picture of herself uh, with hair that's painted in yellow crayons. And to me, I think those are sort of the, those moments, it's forever sealed in my <laughs> mindset. It's saying, you know, there's so much that we need to do. If, if we are as an activist, as a movement builder, it's, there are all these facets of me, of, of my identity that 
need to have a way of expressing it, need to be taken as whole, right? Um, usually in the labor movement, we talk about in grievances, we file grievances saying to be made whole. And to me, I think of my, all my years here in Canada has been a journey of trying to, <laughs> to push for more space to, to have the opportunity to be made and be recognized as whole. Yeah. So, so it's, it's in that sense, the intersectionality of race, class, and gender. It's always, I think to me, that's the fire that keeps me going all the time. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always interesting to me how political activists like uh, develop ideas about change, social change, and how we, how we can like participate in that and um, how we can flex power, right? Social power, political power, economic power. And both of your stories and some of the, what you just shared with me, um, you know, they tell me a lot about how those formative experiences stay with you. They stay with you permanently. And sometimes in the moment of them happening, you don't have the political power mm -hmm. to respond to that or to change that in the moment. But then that, like those memories or those feelings and those, you know, emotions, they are sustained inside. And then you spend, you know, the rest of your life in some ways, you know, renegotiating that and making sure that that's not. Now you were talking about being like a student activist at Ryerson when you enrolled in Ryerson. Um, you know, doing that to being a labor organizer, there's some steps in between, like what were you know, was there a moment where you were organizing? You were like, yeah, like, screw this. I can really implement and Im impact change through organizing. What was a early organizing victory for you that taught you this is possible? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would also just sort of say sort of I, I, I think I arrived in Canada with a real sort of developed class consciousness. Because I think the process of emigrating here too was a, a really big issue, um, especially seeing my family. I was lucky to not like Winnie to sort of come with my mum and dad and 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 younger brother. Um, but the whole process of settling in this country was brutal, and seeing my dad kind of come as a car mechanic and then not being able to get uh, basically told he couldn't work as a car mechanic. And then my mum, who was an office worker, uh, basically deal with a lot of sexual harassment and, and bad working conditions and just seeing them really struggle was, was also part of that. But I think that one of the earliest things that I was involved with was at the end of my first year. So I started Bryson at 17. And at the end of my first year, the engineering department, uh, students that had dominated the student union, basically shut down the women's center on the last day of school. And so I ended up spending my entire summer, I was basically commuting uh, from Scarborough. So working at the Scarborough Town Center as a retail worker. And then any spare time I had, it was poured into basically uh, contacting. So, I mean, you can just imagine I'd barely been in the country for a year and I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just trying to contact women's centers and women's organizations to write letters of support. And, and it became like a, a year long campaign to get the women's center a new space. Basically, we were thrown out of our space and um, the writing center was put in there and, and they were hoping that the women would just disappear. And it was I think it's really important to remember that it, it was a period of time. It was like 30 years ago when, you know, when when sexual assaults and rapes happened on campus, it was the staff, uh, the you know, OPSU staff members that would come to the women's center and say, hey, did you know that this is going on? Because it was not like there was no harassment center. There was there was none of the infra, in, infrastructure at that point. It was just, be, as I said, just before La Col Polytechnique. It was when, you know, at Queen's University, you know, no means tie her up, no means beat her into submission. It was during that period of time where just to be part of the Women's Center was actually putting a target on your back, 
right? Uh, being queer was being putting a target on your back. Um, I remember the queer sign, it was called Be Glad at that point, uh, the Bisexual Gay Lesbian Alliance. Um, their sign was, van our sign was vandalized every single day, every single day. It was up, it was vandalized. So it was a period of time where it was incredibly conservative. And so, yeah, so we won the space for the Women's Center. Uh, we, we, we um, you know, ran a really important campaign. And I think that was, the, that was the period of time where I was like starting to sort of understand what organizing meant um, and, and to really try to, and that led me to then work with other students to develop riots and students against racism, uh, make sure that the students union um, uh, had a pink, had pink pages at that point, which was sort of the first time it happened, like really just trying to push the boundaries of, of all of those things. Right. Yeah. Winnie? Yeah, I guess for me it was, um, I moved to, from Montreal to Toronto in 1975. So my first full-time job was actually at University Settlement House, right behind the art gallery in the heart of the Chinatown then, uh, as a crisis counselor, as an organizer. And so I was working with a lot of uh, newcomers from Hong Kong, from China, uh, where the family's unit usually had the husband working as a restaurant worker, and the wife or the mother works as a, um, sewing machine operator right on Spadina, one of the, the, the garment factories. And between them, they juggle the childcare and so on and so forth. Um, and it's recognizing the, within the workplaces, um, the exploitations, the divide and rule that goes on and on. Um, you know, I'm not just gonna share a very short story. It's, there was one particular workplace where the, the employer at the end of every year in, her, in his Christmas party would put all the names of the workers as a, in a box and they do a lucky draw. And oh, after the pizza, they get, there'll be two winners. And these two winners, these two workers will be entitled to the 4% vacation pay in the year. Right? And it's, it's those situations that I recognize as a social worker you can't, you, the individual solutions is not, it's band-aid, right? And it's not deep enough to create that sense of unity among uh, women workers from the different language groups and from different places. And so that's when, when I made the, you know, the leap to go into as an organizer with the International Ladies Garment Workers. Because it's, it's in that sense, it's, I've always used that, you know, when you hold out a fist in the labor movement, it has to be, you clasp, <laughs> clench your fist and you can't fight employers. You can't fight the power, the abusive power with two fingers or three, three fingers. So how do we, so, I mean, that has been an ongoing journey. It's how do we create that clench fist that stay? <laughs> so that's my, that's my, I guess in my own journey and, and, I must say, you know, there are times I'm sure Dina feels the same, that it's, it's tiring to be the first. <laughs> it's tiring to be the first union organizer, women of color organizers, and, uh, and being dismissed and looked down as well. So, I mean, those are some of the, I guess we all gone through some of these experiences, but it's, it's also that sense that how do we engage without losing ground and without losing our own integrity and dignity and hope as well. Well, and this is where I feel sort of like I've been following like the, the path laid out by Winnie because I ended up at the International Ladies Garment Workers Union um, in my fourth year um, at Ryerson, they had placements at that union. Oh, yes. And I, I, I started my, um, so in 1991, I started my placement there. And I really felt like the, the members, and I think that, that ultimately it's really about the members, that I just felt like I'd come home, like these women were, were my family, right? Like the, I grew up with these women in, you know, m most of my family in England work in, 
in the garment industry, in the plastics factories, in the hosiery firms, um, you know, packaging biscuits and, and crisps. Um, that's, that's, that's my family, right? So I came to the union and I was like, bloody hell, I feel home. This is amazing. How do I work with these women? But it was unbeknownst to me that Winnie had just left that you know sort of was just ahead of me and I had just missed her um so um so I ended up at the garment workers union for until 1997 um for exactly all of the reasons that that you know Winnie just outlined in terms of it just made so much sense to sort of work with women from our communities that were were that to help facilitate their ability to organize and and to become that fist and uh i think that is the most um incredibly exciting work to be done to be honest yeah and a lot of times it's i guess it ties in with how do we in union organizations how how we how do we harness that anger or that sense of being treated unfairly yes and encourage them to act and if I can, so if I can reflect on sort of my own union experience, is I think we, you know, as organizers, we, I guess then there was a much more bureaucratic way of doing things. And I, Dina, you can talk about it. We organize, we sign, we talk to, do we go do house visit, we sign up workers, we win the vote, and then we pass it on to the business agents, quote unquote, yeah. <laughs> who hardly don't know these women whatsoever. And they take it from there. They take it, everything out of, of my hand. And to me, I think this is where um, it, it's the downfall. And I'm, I was a part of that too. And it's the need for continuous organizing, right? Continuous organizing beyond just winning the, the certifications, but continuous organizing throughout so people could be more empowered to demand, to fight for their rights, fight for what's in their contract. And I think this is where, you know, um, if we had to I have to do it all over again, it should be just one continuous unit rather than organizers separate from being a business agent or being a union rep. Because then this is the where we develop the critical relationship that deepen their sense of belonging and deepen that sense of commitment as union members. Yeah. Well, you you know, Winnie, um, you're talking about in some ways uh, different visions or ideas of trade union organizing or labor organizing, um, contrasting bread and butter, you know, business style unionism to social unionism, you know, a union uh, movement that is much more, you know, holistic in terms of understanding its relationships outside of, you know, in mm -hmm. institutional structure, which is quite radical. And um, though earlier you were saying, Winnie, you know, there's some of this fatigue and being tired of always being the first and having to, uh, I, I mean, without a doubt, being the first um, one of color in the room and many of those you know, union spaces, you had to address and negotiate and think through how to deal with, you know, many different ways in which racist sexism, you know, um, uh, were, you know, directed towards you. And you had to really, I'm sure, I know you as a thoughtful organizer, be thoughtful and strategic about deciding, you know, which fights to take on in the, in the labor movement, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about that, Winnie? Yeah, <laughs> I guess it's, it's, I think I go, you know, in those spaces, I go in with my eyes wide open and, rec and sort of have a sense of what do I want to use that space for, to, to maximize. For example, when I took on the position as the CLC regional uh, director in Ontario, I know I walk in knowing quite clearly I, we, I need, we need to nurture to bring in more racialized folks, uh, trade unionists into everything that we do within the, the institution, within the labor movement. But at the same time, I know that I'm going in with an agenda 
to open up spaces for the younger ones that were coming in, right? So that's when we started the whole solidarity works where you know, uh, a lot more young workers, regardless whether they are from the union or, or the community, to have a space to share some of these issues. And I think the part of the, the tiredness or the fatigue is more sort of the, <laughs> the, 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 the repeated effort having to keep proving yourself. Yeah. Uh, uh, among these white male leaders. And then, and some of these times when we push back, when we, you know, challenge the status quo, uh, then our loyalty to the labor movement or to the organization is taken to task. Yeah. And I, you, you know, I paved deeply for, <laughs> for standing up as well. So, but then I think there's just that refusal among all of us who are activists to say, we are not gonna settle for the crumbs. We are not gonna be silenced and we're not gonna stay put in the space that you prescribe to us. And I think to me, that's where the, uh, you know, the, the affinity with other workers of color, black, indigenous and racialized folks becomes such a, such a support and such a, a nourishment to the soul for all of us, you know, as activists, it's then you know that that I that this is not only your experience, but uh, experiences among all of us, and we need to strategize, come together, and strategize on how we could make it better for the next generations. Yeah. Ina, yeah, yeah, Dina, I feel like you can come in here. I want to. Um, oh yeah, a few things you add. You said there, Winnie, but I would like to ask you, Dina, because you've worked inside labor, and then you clearly made a very deliberate choice about, you know, um, working with the Workers' Action Centre, about found, founding the Workers' Action Centre, as deciding that, you know, there needed to be a space that was worker-controlled, worker-directed. Can you talk about, you know, making mm, that yeah. decision? Sure. I mean, I, I think that, so I think one of the, the um, positive things that I experienced working with the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union was it was also sort of at this time when the NDP was in power. And so there was a lot of money to sort of support community initiatives and uh, different things. Um, and there was this moment during the ILG when I was there that we were doing a lot of different things. So we had started up uh, an association for women, uh, mainly Chinese who worked at home who were doing sewing um, and, and we started the Coalition for Fair Wages and Working Conditions for home-based workers. Uh, we were starting to organize Tamil women who were working in the home doing food production, um, you know, uh, Latinas who were doing uh, craft-based work at home. I was able to set up a childcare center at the union. I set up computer classes, uh, link classes, ESL classes. Um, I was doing a lot of training with our members uh, when I first started at the union, um, even though it was like or probably like 85% women, only one woman was on the district council. Um, the representation was atrocious. And so there were a lot of systemic issues, um, but a lot of progressive women ended up being hired and we were allowed a bit of freedom. That really changed when we merged with uh, the uh, we merged with another union in 1995, and so you know, long story short, I, I hit the brick wall and uh, sort of you know uh, was in some ways forced out of my work and uh, for, forced out of the organizing job that I had and felt um, a little lost after that uh, in terms of, of trying to. You know, I thought I would have, I thought I was going to stay with the union probably for the rest of my life because the the women and the members were just so incredible, um, and and you know uh, felt like my family. But I think it also kind of made me feel, and and a number of other people sort of think about sort of why why did we hit the brick wall? Why wasn't uh, a more 
flexible understanding of uh, what an organization could do in the labor movement. How could you build an organization that would actually reflect and be a space for, for racialized workers, for women of color, for, for the workers who had the least power in the in 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 the in the workplace, and I think there was this moment. I think especially um, in the union that I was working for, where our communities were seen as not seen as a whole. They were seen as well. You know, these communities are hard to organize because of what they've experienced back home. But these communities have a lot of political organizing from their own home countries. So we should focus on these people, not these people. <laughs> and, you know, and it was a numbers game. It was like, well, we don't want to focus on small workplaces or subcontractors because they're too hard to organize. Mm -hmm. We want to go for the workplaces that are over 100. And, and, and you know, you need to, sh you, you know, you got to, perform and it was almost like it was like a I mean it was it was uh the pressure to unionize in in a um uh, in a very basically capitalist business way was disgusting and it was just everything in me that was just like wanting to run away and and I ended up sort of you know um being out because obviously are the what I what my beliefs were were coming into uh conflict so I ended up leaving, but I think what all of that stuff led me, and so I don't regret it because I think what it did was it it sort of yeah. taught me some really hard lessons around understanding what is it that we need to, like, can we really transform a trade union or do we need to start again? Do we need to start a new organization? Is there a way to explore what that could mm -hmm. be and what the potential power of that could be when you have racialized staff where you have a, a, an emphasis and a priority and the belief that our communities can organize and resist and be given leadership and power and decision making and we can achieve change and we don't need you know white people to do that for us right like what a freaking concept and so you know our, so so the worker center has been this you know, I've been working on it now for over 20 years, and now we have a worker center where I still feel like I'm still learning every single day how to do this work. But what we are doing is we're doing all of that. We're prioritizing workers who have the least power in the workplace, who have the least ability to unionize, who have the least ability to get access to lab basic labor standards and to try to open up the space for them through their own workplace experience to become leaders in the struggle. And that has been uh, absolutely incredible uh, sort of uh, sort of an experience. And and I think that it it because I was sick, just like Winnie was of of pounding my head against the freaking brick wall of saying, no, no, <laughs> just give us a chance. We can do this. Um, look at what look at the potential. And none of that was allowed. And I feel like I've been going to union conferences for a long time. I remember a conference in 1995 uh, at the Ontario Federation of Labor on community unionism. We're still having that conversation. <laughs> and it's and it's what year is it? 2021. Like enough like we just have to just get on with the work and so part of the center was about me just getting on with the work and fed up with spending my time trying to transform stuff and just saying you know what like there are worker centers in the U.S. that have just decided to just freaking do it I want I want to try and figure out how to do that and so it's been a really difficult journey it's been a tough journey but it's been one that now we're at a, at a place where you know I just I'm so glad that that even though it was very scary and just sort of pushed ahead to do it. Well, I, I wonder like if we could be a bit specific, what do you think are the kinds of um, organizing approaches or strategies that racialized low wage workers bring to the table that's different, that's unique, that's distinct, that uh, is effective? You know, what are the uh, perspectives that, um, you know, make, uh, organizing in community organ union organizing you know um 
a thing of its own? I mean, I think people are fearless. Like, I think people yeah. have nothing left to lose. I mean, they're already in the shittiest jobs, the worst conditions, they've lost everything. And, you know, I've heard consistently, oh, well, those people, they can't organize, you know, they're just too busy, busy surviving. I say bullshit. You know, if you don't have those people who are the core of your organizing, you ain't going to do not do anything. And so I am inspired every day by the fearlessness, by the commitment, by the sense of justice, by the sense of uh, comradeship um, that uh, our communities bring. I mean, I'm not romanticizing it. There's a lot of other shit too, like for sure, right? Um, there's fear, there's like, you know, um, you know, there's the challenges of building a multiracial organization. But at the end of the day, what, what I think when you start with women of color, racialized women, black women as your base, and you work to improve uh, and change the conditions mm -hmm. that face um, those workers, you bring everybody else up. And I think that, um, you know, we have seen that during the pandemic, the kind of incredible courageousness and bravery of migrant workers, of, you know, farm workers speaking out and losing, you know, the ability to be in the country of uh, women who are care workers, um, who have been trapped inside employers' homes, but have said, screw it, I'm going to speak out, you know, international students who are just like, you know, pushing the boundaries, undocumented workers, women who have uh, from the Latinx community that have just been fearless in their organizing um, around status for all. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And I think sort of like, for me, it's about building a movement that brings everyone in. I feel like when I was within the union, it was kind of like, well, no, we're allowed to deal with you, but we're not allowed to deal with you. And you have left the union, so we can't deal with you. And so part of the center has been about, let's break down those barriers. If you're unemployed, you can still be a member. If you're on social assistance, if you have lost your job, if you are, you you know, it doesn't matter. Like you are part of the labor movement and you have a role to play. You have a position here. And so part of it is just kind of breaking down all of those silos, all of those yes. boring, stale male white roles and just saying, let's just friggin' throw it away and let's just figure it out. And so, yeah, made lots of mistakes, but we're trying, you know, but like how the hell are you supposed to learn, right? And I think fundamental in that is about how to do that real work. I think that Winnie was saying around, how do you, how do you teach people to be the fist? or that they know how to, to do that work, but how do you bring everyone together to be that, you know? Like they individually might be there, but then how do you sort of help people work together to be part of that struggle together, regardless of where they may come from in the world? And that I think has been really exciting. And, and that to me, I think this is where Workers' Action Center has been a beacon of hope. And I'm, I guess I'm not, giving up on the labor movement, because it's too, no. yeah. But it's how do we replicate that approach within the labor movement, right? Um, you know, Minso, your, your earlier questions, I could say, like, when I work with the PMP workers, you know, the workers who, <laughs> who has their jobs pull out of, <laughs> under their rug, under their feet, uh, when the company, file for bankruptcy protections over the uh, like July 1st long weekend and they came to the fact came to workplace after long weekend and found the whole whole place locked down it's when workers have nothing to nothing else to lose there's a whole different sense of dignity and strength that we the white leaderships always underestimate. And to exactly. me, I think those are the powerful moments. And the other examples is I want to bring in is sort of the more creative ways of organizing, of, of keeping the members engaged, right? For example, when I was at the 
HERE Local 75, we the, the women members, Black and racialized women, they were the one who said, how about we start a choir? And using, you know, so if, like all these women, 40 of them, after working a long day at 4.30, would walk over to Trinity Church right next to Eaton Center and have another hour and a half of a choir practice. And this is where they learn that nurture that critical con connections. They learn songs. So it's, you know, it's at union politics or political consciousness. It's not just through education and speeches. It's through the songs that they sing together about fighting back, that we are the lions, you know, we're fighting back. And to me, I think those are the moments, those are, we, I guess within the traditional labor movement, we have not been willing to take the risk or willing to put enough trust among the diverse members to make that space a whole lot more integrated, a whole, I, I hate the word inclusive, to, to make the place and deepen that sense of belonging for all members, right? And that's why I think, you know, uh, it's, it's so critical that if, you know, we, we shouldn't be quote unquote let out of the gate per se, <laughs> but how do we recreate, how do we dismantle and how do we confront and dismantle white supremacy within our labor movement, not just within the workplace, but beyond and create a whole new movement, a whole new community that is grounded on progressive and radical politics. And I think sort of just like, how do we create those spaces where people can stop feeling so isolated in their work? Like so many low wage workers and so many workers of color feel so, they just imagine you go to work and you just deal with indignity and lack of respect and poor working conditions every single day, right? And you spend the majority of your time in these places. And then you go to a union meeting where basically there's a there's a table in front where the secretary and this person there and there's a roll call and it's so formal and you you know you and and it's it's isolating and disconnected and i'm not i'm not saying that like so this is not me dissing trade unions what this is about is saying like we have to be we have to we have to have critical re reflection on how we do mm -hmm. every single thing because it all sends a message to someone it it creates a, a distance of the union and us whereas we're supposed to all be the union right there's not supposed to be this separation but so many union meetings are held in this bureaucratic disconnected isolated way and people are scared and nervous and intimidated like in a, like what so that's one of the things that we try to do is just break that down at the center right i mean obviously the pandemic has been difficult in terms of you know how do you do that online but like in our center, it's like, you know, music and and, and food and mm. having a cup of tea together and breaking open the box of cookies and making sure that every, you know, like, and, and then people are serving each other and, and just trying to create that sense of warmth and family because we need that to be able to struggle. How do you sustain yourself and nurture yourself to, to in, in that daily struggle? And if you don't get that from your your union if you don't get that from your place of work like where are you getting it from in many cases we're going home to our families who are also all stressed out and trying to struggle yeah. to pay the bills right so it is it's it's a real kind of like trying to tear apart all of the things that we know and rebuild it and in some ways because we've started the workers action center from scratch there was no there was no like pathway. We had to kind of develop it ourselves and figure it out. And as I said, it's not been perfect. And it's certainly, you know, we're still learning all the time. But I think because we didn't have that baggage, like mm -hmm. because we could just start from what we knew and how we wanted to do stuff, like it, 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 it has helped create a, a culture that 
people feel people talk about the Workers Action Center being a member as being part of the WAC family. And that to me makes me feel really good, right? Because I think at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're you know, we, we got to have each other's yeah. back and, and you don't necessarily feel that in, in a lot of organizations. No, I think that um, there's a global trade union culture yeah. that, uh, you know, is quite radical and revolutionary uh, in the global South primarily. And, you know, my own personal familiarity is with the trade union culture in Korea, for example, which was very, you know, tied to a democracy movement that overthrew a government, right? Yeah. What we're dealing with here in Canada is a trade union movement that's still very much a Eurocentric one that's, you know, aligns itself with very colonial ways of operating and has professionalized an understanding of its role in civil society. And it's very much a barrier for racialized workers to see themselves in that structure, mm. right? But not giving up on the labor movement. No, <laughs> no absolutely way. not. It, it's actually about working within, alongside, right? And throughout. So um, we've only got about nine minutes left and I'm oh. surprised how quickly this has happened. And I really had so many other things to talk about. <laughs> I wanted to ask you uh, about lessons in the last year in the pandemic, you know, Without a doubt, I think the pandemic has radicalized people, has made people understand like the choices are quite stark. And it's become a cliche to say the, that the pandemic has exposed the stark inequities in our society and sort of, you know, um, concretized them. Not just that, but also the, the rhetoric and the hypocrisy of celebrating and valorizing essential workers, yeah. but then denying them you know, uh, paid sick days or like basic supports and benefits. So. In the short time that we have left, Winnie and Dina, I wonder whether you want to reflect on uh, what do you believe are, because, you know, this past year has been this sort of time of urgent learning in some way, urgent doing and urgent learning, all kind of simultaneous, right? So what are the kinds of lessons that have really stood out for you about the, the need, um, the, the organizing that's happening with um, racialized low-wage workers and um, you know, what's working, what are the challenges? Uh, yeah. Um, Winnie, did you want to go or? Yeah, you go first. It's oh. okay. Yeah. I mean, I, to, I mean, to be honest, like, um, I think the organizing and that, and I think building and keeping that sense of connection. So one of the, obviously we were, we were so stressed out because we knew that so many of the people that we know in the workplaces um, wouldn't necessarily get employment insurance, no benefits, like working for cash under the table, migrant workers. I mean, so it was a real incredible sense of like, holy shit, what the hell are we gonna do? And so we just, um, so we just, just listened and organized and kept everyone connected. So we immediately went into um, working with food share to supply uh, food boxes. And we had, uh, we turned the Workers Action Center into basically a distribution center on Saturdays. So every week, every Saturday, we had, um, we had food boxes, we had frozen dinners, we had PPE, we uh, raised money to get income into, especially folks who were migrant and undocumented workers' hands who had no access to anything. But through that process, we still kept organizing, right? Around the federal $15 minimum wage, the income benefits, status, we started the status for all campaign with the Migrant Rights Network and, um, and all the groups across the country who organize around migrant worker rights. And so when people were coming in on Saturdays for their food boxes, it was a chance for us to connect, say, you know, how are you doing? You know, are you eating properly? Like what's going on? Like how are things happening? And, and then, oh, guess what's happening? We're launching this campaign and we're doing this and can you get involved in this? So we just kept moving on paid sick days, moving on the status for all, moving on the income benefits, moving on all of the issues that were directly impacting workers. And then people started to come out to all the actions. And so what we started to see was, especially the status for all stuff, was that many of the new people that we were meeting, that we were connecting with, and because we just opened our doors and we said, 
whoever needs support, just come, tell everyone. And, and that's what we did. And we just basically said we would just try and find the money to help as pe many people as possible. What that's led to has been like a massive increase in our membership. Uh, we now have close to 400 members, which was, you know, we started out with 200. And all of those members are really active and have been engaged with the center. And we, um, you know, it, we are learning how to organize digitally. But, but I think the big thing was, was that trying to immediate, deal with people's immediate needs was critical, but yeah. then also connecting them through that to the broader political issues. And saying like, this is happening, you need food, let's get you food but this is the freaking problem like why are you not getting access to benefits just because you don't have a valid social insurance number that's crap right so let's let's do this and then having wins along the way on the political front has then helped bolster all of that stuff so i think that symbiotic relationship between the immediate needs throwing everything again out of the door, just going, okay, let's just go for whatever people need. Let's just respond. And then, but, but continuing the organizing. So yeah, but through that experience, I've learned that <laughs> that's really critical. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's really good that actually what's happening with Dina's shop, you know, at the workers action center, it's happening across the globe. Like I volunteer with the International Domestic Workers Union and they've been devastated with the pandemic or their members. So in, in Cape Town, South Africa, that's exactly what's happening. They have soup kitchen, people coming together, bringing whatever they have and then sharing it within the com a, a broader community. It's happening in Asia countries and elsewhere. Wow. It's And to me, I think there's a whole, the pandemic is also, you know, manifest that no one is safe until all of us are safe, right? And so the, the linkage between global south and global north here, it's that sense of equity that, that needs to be, to be addressed, right? Particularly now with the vaccine shortage, it's a replicate of the privilege and, the, um, and positioning. And I guess the other lessons, I mean, the pandemic also ties in with uh, the Black Lives, the global Black Lives movement yeah. protests, you know, as a result of the murder of George Floyd. And to me, I think this is where it's, this is such a, as a Angela Davis said, it's such an extraordinary moment that for the first time ever, systemic racism is rendered visible. So as racialized folks, you know, who are involved in our own communities, how do we seize this moment and mix and do something much more radical and revolutionary. And to me, it's how do we build that links with on, on folks who are fighting on anti-indigenous racism, anti-black racism, and anti-Asian racism and Islamophobia and all the other isms. How do we build and un be united to confront white supremacy? To me, I think that's a priority now within the labor movement. It's how do we seize this moment and start building and start confronting and having that courage to say, I'm not alone and we should take this on. Because I mean, right now it's, you have all these equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives. It's like a whole booming industry, yeah. but all the EDI, IDE, if not, we don't address some of the source of the problem in terms of capitalism, colonialism, and white supremacy, this is going to be D-I-E, die, for the labor movement. And, and so I, I guess I'm sensing an urgency. And part of <laughs> being on this is saying, let's push and push the frame and push the space so we can have some really challenging conversation, even though it might be creating discomfort among the white brothers and sisters, but it needs to happen, right? I think opening up that space, I think sometimes we, th those of us who, I think that we can assume that people understand what white supremacy is, right? And I think that part of it is opening up the space for people to 
to have those deeper conversations, because I think that if we don't understand truly what white supremacy is, then we won't understand our own um, uh, natural alliance and solidarity that we have with um, the black community and with the indigenous community. And I think it's really, and you can get kind of like distracted and swept away into yeah. sort of you know those diversity and inclusion initiatives and we saw that in 1995 when that was also a hotbed of like diversity training as well and again a lot of money was made by a lot of people but anyway so so i think you could see that happening again and but i think that part of it is also about like so for whack you know how do we support our staff and our senior leaders to ha understand what white supremacy is and and have that conversation and so you know we've been reading policing black uh, black lives by robin maynard um which was uh, suggested to us uh, to do as a book club um uh, and and that has been i think a really interesting moment for us uh to consistently not just have one conversation but to go chapter by chapter by chapter and actually collectively understand the legacies of, of systemic racism and colonialism um, that Canada is built on. And I think that, you know, we are having conversations that we wouldn't necessarily do because we are dealing with urgent issues all the time. So carving that space out and, and being supportive to one another in that discussion i think is really quite critical at this moment so that people can go deeper but be you know but be supported to go deeper in their understanding yeah and being also reflective in terms of our own position and complicity yeah in this whole project it's sort of i'll end with andrea smith's quote is how do we ensure that our model of liberations will not become does not become a model of oppression for others. Okay, well, that's a that's a good quote to end with. I have to say, both of you, I want to thank you because I feel like we were able to sort of travel a bit of a chronology, uh, going back to you know, going back to memories and lessons learned through uh, the decades of organizing that you have both been part of, but also then use that to reflect on the current moment, and that's what's so critical about the current moment. It's an opportunity and a challenge. Right. It could so easily and we are seeing co-optation happening in mm. real time where uh, urgencies become mollified through diversity management or through, you know, um, a different way of uh, understanding how to respond that are not structural or systemic. So it's so important to have the reflective time to think about uh, what happened previously, even in, back in the 90s, Dina, when you're talking about sort of that moment of a lot of organizing, particularly around the cultural front on identity politics and like what happened to that moment? What real sustained change did we achieve? I think we did achieve quite a bit, right? But we're building on that. There was a there was a pushback from that, you know, the mid 90s. And I remember it so distinctly. I was working at CKLN when CKLN was being attacked and dismantled because it was a very empowering you know, media hub in a space for grassroots organizing. So I have to say, being able to share with both of you some of the lessons learned and ideas of how we move forward has been really instructive. And I want to thank you. It's interesting, Dina, that you're talking about reading Robin Maynard because she is a panelist for uh, this program. She's going to be speaking tomorrow at oh my God. 30 in a panel with Harsha Walia, Eric Erica Violet Lee and uh, Ian Tian, moderated by Beverly Bain tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon at 4.30. There's a great program for this entire two day weekend, thinking through anti-Asian racism, not through like one siloed lens, but through a very intersectional lens, uh, understanding um, that you can't separate, you know, anti-Asian racism from so many of the other structures of oppression and discrimination. Winnie and Dina, Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mingzhou, you. for inviting us. Thanks, Winnie. Thank you, Dina. Good luck with your AGM tonight. Yes. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye.